All right, good afternoon. I am uh, Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and I am pleased to co chair today's oversight hearing on the feasibility of microgrids with Councilmember Rafael Espinal, Chair of our Consumer Affairs Committee. Uh, microgrids are another tool the city could invest in to provide reliable energy sources and to ensure that our energy infrastructure is resilient against extreme weather events while reducing pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. A microgrid is a group of interconnected local energy resources with clearly defined electrical boundaries. A relatively small local power network, a microgrid consists of electricity generation sources, electricity users, and control equipment within a geographically defined area. Although microgrids are usually connected to a centralized electrical grid, they can also operate on island mode which means they can access locally generated electricity regardless of whether the larger centralized electric grid is fully functional. Numerous utilities have proposed microgrids as a way of hardening and improving utility infrastructure and resiliency. The potential for microgrids is significant because they can be powered by a variety of energy sources, including combined heat and power, district geothermal, in conduit hydropower, and solar thermal or solar, solar voltaic energy all of which may be feasible to power microgrids in New York City. Geothermal energy systems combined with photo, solar photovoltaic systems can not only provide reliability, but can also do so by generating minimal or no greenhouse gases. In conduit hydropower can be used at a local site or connected to the grid and can be designed to support district geothermal systems for heating, cooling, and electricity when electricity utility service is unavailable. This is important for our city because energy can account for as much as 10 percent of local government's annual operating budget, a proportion that is likely to grow as energy prices rise. Microgrids do currently exist in New York City. For example, Co-op City in the Bronx is a microgrid powered by a combined heat and power that serves some 50,000 residents in 35 high-rise apartment buildings and seven townhouse developments, three shopping centers and five schools. Co-op City's microgrid has made news when it ensured the community that it did not lose power before, during, or after Superstorm Sandy. However, we need to explore how we can build more microgrid infrastructure for communities around the city. New York City has a nine-month heating season. The largest cost in heating is the cost of fossil fuel. Providing heating, cooling, electricity without paying for the cost of fossil fuel will ensure the benefit to the public and consumers. The only sustainable way to the future is to reduce and transition away from the use of fossil fuels. Microgrids will help us achieve economies of scale as we move towards a fossil fuel-free future. I want to recognize uh, we are joined today by Councilmember Rory Lansman from Queens. Uh, and now we will hear from uh, the great chair of our, our Consumer Affairs Committee. Oh, Eric Ulrich as well from Queens is here. Thank you, Eric. I missed you there on my right because I was looking to my left. Uh, our, our great chair of our Consumer Affairs Committee, uh, Councilmember Espinal. Thank you so much, Costa. Good evening. Good afternoon, I should say. My name is Rafael Espinal. I'm the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee. Today I'm pleased to co-chair this hearing uh, with the chair of the Environmental Protection Committee and my colleague, Costa Constantinides. I believe that it is absolutely important to explore the feasibility of microgrids and that our city should take the lead on this. Microgrids will be a key to our city's sustainability, both as a daily source of power and in emergency situations. Superstorm Sandy resulted in the deaths of 44 New Yorkers and caused $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. The environmental events impacted the city's infrastructure, including its electricity generation and distribution system, causing power outages to critical facilities, including hospitals and nursing homes, and leaving 800,000 New Yorkers without power. We must be better prepared. We saw then and continue to see with recent hurricanes in Florida, Texas, and Puerto Rico what these destructive environmental disasters can cause and how essential it is to be prepared. More than this, the New York City Panel on Climate Change projects that by the year 2050 in New York City, extreme weather events are likely to worsen. Heat waves, heavy downpours, and coastal flooding are also likely to increase in frequency, extent, and duration. So the time for action is now. A microgrid is a small power network that is capable of generating and sharing power with those on its grid. It can disconnect from the grid and operate autonomously, which is touted as having the potential to not only enhance the, stabil the stability of our grid and increase the city's resiliency, but also increase renewable energy sources for consumers. I've seen, I'm seeing amazing work done, particularly in Brooklyn, where entire blocks are being powered by one neighbor. For example, one company, Brooklyn Microgrid, has created a community-powered microgrid consisting of property owners with solar panels on their roofs. 
The company uses a smartphone app and a blockchain ledger, a technology related to Bitcoin, that not only enables these producer or consumers to sell excess energy back to the utility, but also enables them to sell energy to each other as well. This energy sharing is not unlike other aspects of the emerging share economy. That offer, that offer new market options and require government to adapt new regulatory challenges. The possibilities for economic growth, efficiency, and decreasing our, our, our reliance on power conglomerates are endless. Communities that have microgrids installed can reduce their vulnerability to power outages due to extreme weather events and will become much more resilient and self-sufficient in the long term. While, we're not, while we are not hearing the bill today in this oversight hearing, I'd like to mention that I, am, I have introduced a bill, intro number 1567, co-sponsored by Councilmember Constantinides, which will require the, the Office of Long-Term Planning to issue a report on the feasibility of microgrids. Therefore, we are very interested in hearing your ideas on this topic and suggestions you may have about possible spaces where microgrids could be set up, laws and rules that are applicable to building a microgrid, and any imp impediment faced. This hearing is a welcome opportunity to learn more about the universe of microgrids, where they fit into our city's needs, and how it may affect the city's consumers. I want to thank the chair again, Constantinides, for holding this hearing with me. I look forward to our continued work on this issue. All right, I look forward now to hearing from the administration. So I'll have Samara Swanson, our attorney, swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Constantinides and Chair Espinal, and members of the Council's Environmental Protection and Consumer Affairs Committees. I am Suzanne DeRoche, Deputy Director, Infrastructure and Energy, serving jointly in the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Thank you for this opportunity to address the feasibility of microgrids in New York City. It's timely that we're discussing microgrids today. Our electric grid is one of the most critical lifeline systems in our city. It powers our buildings, our hospitals, and our transit system. When it fails, as hurricane, hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria tragically have shown, it can have cascading impacts to our telecommunication system, our economy, and our access to health care. <clears throat> Following the devastation of Hurricane Sandy, the city and the state supported the evaluation and installation of new microgrids in the city that can function independently from the central electric grid and can support critical loads in the event of a power outage. As we have seen, microgrids make sense as custom designed solutions for a set of specific objectives from energy efficiency to cost savings to utilizing renewable energy and ensuring resiliency to the risks of climate change. There are various definitions of what a microgrid is. The city's working definition of a microgrid is, a, is local generation or a set of local generation sources that can be flexibly dispatched to distribute power and in some applications thermal energy to more than one building and can, in the event of a grid outage, operate independently of the electric grid to continue to deliver critical power needs. There are two distinguishing features of a microgrid. Microgrids, can serve, microgrids serve multiple buildings rather than a single building resilient energy solution. And microgrids can island or disconnect themselves from the broader grid to continue to serve a set of local critical loads during a grid outage. There are two main types of microgrids. The first type has been developed for campus style settings where a single entity owns and manages a set of buildings. This type of microgrid has been popular for decades, particularly amongst, among universities and military bases. The second type of microgrid is a multi-owner or multi-user microgrid, where a microgrid serves a mix of buildings and facilities that are owned by multiple entities. This is commonly referred to as a community microgrid. We're currently unaware of any community microgrids that have been successfully put in place in the US, However, in the past several years, there has been a renewed interest in the multi-user microgrids, and several are currently under in design in the feasibility stages. The value of microgrids has traditionally been centered on improving energy efficiency, reducing energy costs, and increasing resiliency to provide power during an outage, as we saw during and after Hurricane Sandy. As mentioned earlier, microgrids can make sense as a custom design solution for a set of site-specific project objectives, ranging from increasing energy efficiency and cost savings, renewable, in, utilizing renewable energy, avoiding carbon emissions, and ensuring resiliency. 
The city's community energy planning analysis detailed in the Roadmap to 80 by 50 report was a first step to understanding where microgrids can provide the most benefit to the city. As we learned, the microgrid's objectives determine which technology is used and therefore the microgrid's capabilities. For example, if the goal is to reduce energy costs, then it would, could be cost prohibitive to also make the microgrid resilient. Similarly, if the goal is to maximize renewable energy use, renewables may be more expensive than what's on offer from the local utility. In short, there are benefit trade-offs with microgrids. Depending on the number of buildings and the energy load required, microgrids can be a costly multi-year infrastructure projects. Moreover, the Con Edison grid as a whole experiences some of the lowest outage rates in the country, complicating the economic case for a microgrid when it is tied to goals other than improving resiliency of critical public services. Recognizing that uh, microgrids can be complex and expensive, which may not be feasible and or cost effective in all parts of the city, the de Blasio administration is nevertheless broadly supportive of them because they can help us achieve a range of our 1NYC sustainability, resiliency, and equity goals. To that end, the city is interested in helping to facilitate microgrids, particularly community microgrids that can promote energy resiliency and integrate renewable energy resources and storage. However, because of the site-specific and complex nature of these projects, conducting a feasibility city for the entire city would be very challenging, would not necessarily lead to the development of any specific projects. There are several microgrids functioning in the city today and several more in the design, feasibility design and construction stages. For example, campus-style microgrids have been built at New York University in Manhattan, Starlet City in Brooklyn, and Co-op City in the Bronx. The NYU and Co-op City microgrids garnered attention after Hurricane Sandy because of their ability to provide resilient electricity and thermal energy. There are several commercial projects in design and construction, including a 13 megawatt microgrid system for Hudson Yards. The city is also exploring the feasibility of microgrids at several other sites. As part of ORR's Hunts Point Resilient Energy Pilot, project, the city is assessing the feasibility of a microgrid for the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. NYCHA is also in the process of developing a microgrid at the Red Hook Houses, which su suffered severe damage during Sandy. The, microgrid, the Red Hook microgrid will provide power to the Red Hook Houses during an area or citywide outage. The Department of Environmental Protection is also developing a 15 megawatt system for the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant in Upper Manhattan, fueled by biogas and natural gas. New York State is also supporting the expansion of microgrids in the city. The New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, through its New York Prize grant program is funding the development of microgrids. The first phase of New York Prize awarded $100,000 individual grants to 83 projects across New York State to conduct initial feasibility assessment, and 11 of those projects were located here in the city. In the second phase in early 2007, NYSERDA awarded $1 million grants to 11 projects statewide to conduct detailed engineering designs and develop business plans, and three of these projects are based in the city. The initial 11 based microgrid projects range from 27 to $273 million for capabilities roughly between 4 megawatts and 20 megawatts, enough to power up to 5,000 and 25,000 apartments respectively. There's also a project in Brooklyn at the Marcus Garvey Houses that incorporates solar plus storage and a natural gas powered fuel cell that was financed by New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation. All existing microgrids in the city mentioned above are natural gas powered, while microgrids in design are, integrated, are integrating sources of renewable power, such as solar plus storage, where feasible. There are technical, business, and regulatory issues that affect the feasibility and cost of expanding microgrid projects in the city. A building's infrastructure plays a key role in the feasibility of a microgrid. If the existing building is not currently wired to separate to separate critical from non-critical loads, rewiring the internal electric distribution system is a significant expense. Buildings also need sufficient space to house the necessary mechanicals or mechanicals on the or on the roof. Sorry, there's a little typo there. That can bear the weight of heavy equipment. 
If the building is in the floodplain, the mechanicals will also need to be protected from flooding. Another consideration is where the proposed microgrid is located on Con Edison system and how the microgrid can technically be configured to island. The configuration of Con Edison's network can make it very challenging to take a section of the electric grid and isolate it from the surrounding system to create a microgrid. There may also be grid, uh, costly grid upgrades necessary to support the amount of on-site generation proposed. Given the city's dense urban environment, a project may also need to install its own electric distribution wires so that the microgrid does not negatively affect the delivery of electricity to neighboring buildings not within the microgrid. The cost to install private wires can be very expensive, especially if installed underground. The owners and operators of this section of private wires will also need, to, will also need an operating and maintenance contract for the upkeep of the microgrid system. With respect to businesses and models, there are few, if any, effective governance and contractual models for multi-user microgrids, although this is an area that is evolving. For, for multi-user microgrids, there's no clear regulatory framework since microgrids have components that can subje be subject to a variety of pre-existing regulatory constructs. For instance, microgrids generate, distribute, and sell, electricity, sell energy to end users, traditionally the purview of utilities and power generators. However, traditional regulatory models that apply to utilities and generating assets might not be appropriate for microgrids, given the differences in scale and magnitude and number of potential stakeholders affected. The lack of regulatory certainty and the risk that it brings to a project is an issue that the de Blasio administration continues to discuss with the New York State Public Service Commission, PSC. The city is a vocal advocate for regulatory and utility tariff reform that supports microgrid development in New York City. For example, the city was effective in advocating for an exemption to the standby rate, which is an additional charge the utility opposes on owner-operators of on-site generation systems, such as combined heat and power systems, which are a common feature of microgrids. Similarly, the city advocated for Con Edison to develop a multi-user offset tariff which allows projects to use on-site generation to offset use at energy use at multiple buildings. To help identify key pain points and challenges, as well as to promote effective business models and regulatory solutions for microgrids, the city has convened a microgrid collaborative featuring key stakeholders including Con Edison, NYSERDA, the New York Power Authority, and others. In addition, the city is also working with the Smart Grid Consortium to identify poli policy and regulatory hurdles to deploying, deploying microgrids in New York City and New York State. In conclusion, I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to discuss the city's approach to microgrids. It's clear that mi microgrids can serve multiple purposes as we seek to increase the sustainability and resiliency of our city. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, so I want to also recognize we have been joined by Councilmember Donovan Richards from Queens as well. Uh, and with that, I have a few questions before I turn it over to my co-chair. Um, first, uh, we talk about resiliency. How does the city view microgrids as part of its resiliency plans? Sure. So microgrids are a, are a component of the city's um, resiliency plans. Um, where they are feasible and, and where they can supply critical loads to hospitals and other types of um, critical public services, we're interested in the development of those. The three um, New York Prize projects are of particular interest as those focus on uh, some critical services. So I saw you mentioned the, uh, the Red Hook houses as a, a place where a microgrid is being installed. Have we looked at other areas that were affected by Hurricane Sandy? and how we can uh, use microgrids for those uh, places as well. Sure, so in the 80 by 50 roadmap, we did an analysis that overlaid the floodplain and also heat risk to try to identify where community energy planning would be most beneficial. The city is looking to uh, make that information public in, the, in hopefully in next year, we're targeting next year. So you'll see parts of the city that will, um, that we think um, community energy solutions, including microgrids, would be most feasible. Great, because I know that I, I have a public housing development that was the only place in my district to lose power and they lost it for close to a week. And, and mm -hmm. I think if there's opportunities for us to uh, protect residents of public housing by doing microgrids throughout the city in low-lying areas, I think it makes a lot of sense. 
Um, so how are we uh, engaging beyond um, this, this sort of task force with NYSERDA? So it's, um, it's important to recognize that these are new projects for the city when they're multi-user, right? And that's what's so exciting and interesting about the New York Prize projects, given the regulatory hurdles and also having to construct the owner-operator models that are multi-user. We want to make sure that we closely monitor how those projects are designed um, and, that, and see how they move through into construction before um, that we embark on many other microgrid uh, solutions throughout the city. And how have the conversations been with Condison so far in making this work, right? So Condison is an active partner of those projects, um, and they are part of the other stakeholder groups that I, that I mentioned. Um, you know, microgrids are part of the distributed energy resources that um, both the state and the city are interested um, in changing how our energy grid works. So I guess the next question I have is relating to STEAM. How do we look to incorporate STEAM as part of our uh, in consideration for microgrid potential? Sure. So um, microgrids, by definition, are delivering the electricity, right? But often they can be... Um, the power can be delivered, uh, can be generated through a cogen plant, right? And that can also make steam, um, which can provide heating and cooling. So mm -hmm. cogeneration is an efficient way to, to build the power source in a, at a localized scale. So the, the most bang for your buck, the most efficient and cost efficient way to do these things is to do cogeneration uh, with steam, heat and, heat and hot water. And we're seeking to do that in... So most of the New York Prize projects have, co have a cogeneration element. Um, some of them have also incorporated small-scale renewables and um, some storage as well. And, and, and as what energy source would, could the city more fully consider um, as far as white microgrids? Where, where are we, where's sort of the next, you know, it's sort of, I know it's a new technology, mm -hmm. but where, is sort of the, sure. where are we going, geothermal and others? Sure. So I think it's important to, to recognize that um, as I, as I laid out in my testimony, that each one is sort of site-specific, right, depending on what the loads are. So a hospital's load is going to be different than a university load, is going to be different than a residential area load. So we need to make sure that we're matching the correct technology to what that microgrid would be serving. So it needs to have both the, the heating and cooling component and the um, electric component if it's going to be a full system that might utilize geothermal. So there isn't, isn't like one particular energy source, either geothermal, renewables, cogen. We, we need really, it's not one sort of It's not a one-size-fits-all. Size all. As I said earlier, much, uh, most of the systems are relying at least primarily on a cogen system uh, right. because it can generate the electricity and the, the heat and cooling. All right, great. Well, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Espinal. Thank you. Thank you, Costa. Um, Question, just to piggyback on, on his question of where these grids are located, are you aware of the, of the grid? I'm, you most likely are. That's on Brownsville, one of the Brownsville NYCHA developments. Um, can you clarify what you mean by the There's grid? a microgrid, I believe, in one of the um, housing developments in Brownsville that was, uh, that was installed recently. So I'm not aware of one that was installed. I am aware of a New York Prize project that was in Brownsville. Okay. Um, that made it through the first stage of New York Prize and did a feasibility assessment, that first $100,000 assessment. So they, they received that grant to, to... To do a feasibility assessment, Okay, yes. okay. Um, so I became really interested in this issue when I heard about private companies that were actually um, helping homeowners in areas like in Park Slope uh, produce energy um, and then also be able to sell that energy using the conventional grid that's currently in place. Um, is, has there been any um, conversation or thought given by the administration about how we can help continue uh, to promote this sort of um, work being done? Privately? Absolutely. So um, community solar is something that the city is, is quite focused on. We have um, a program called the Solarize Campaign, and we're always looking for more districts that are interested in Solarize. I believe um, we act is is in the uh, in is going to testify, and and they are a Solarize participant. Um, and what that comes with is twenty thousand dollars to help um, a local CBO do the outreach necessary to get people subscribed um, to really move that community solar piece forward um, I, on private residents. I, I just see it as a great a great way to um, continue to green the city 
uh, making sure that we're producing cleaner energy, not relying on the on the conventional uh, power plant that's upstate somewhere, um, and being able to again green our city and and go for that goal. Yes, we share those goals. Okay. Thank you for uh, your testimony today. Um, and uh, you know, I guess, I mean, I think we have a shared goal, right? I mean, I, as someone that has uh, power plants, peaker plants in my district um, that uh, provide 55% of the city's power, I, I'm very concerned uh, and find ways to get off the grid and, and find ways that we can do more renewables. I think we share that goal of seeing those plants utilized less and less so the, with all the pollution that comes along with them. Um, so I, I look forward to working with you and with our chair uh, of our Consumer Affairs Committee, uh, Councilman Espinal, to uh, see how microgrids fit uh, into that plan. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, uh, Anel Hernandez, please come forward, from New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, Carrie Dietrich from 350 Brooklyn, and Scott Kessler from Brooklyn Microgrid. And, oh, and I want to rec recognize that we have Vinnie Gentili from Brooklyn, who is a member of the Consumer Affairs Committee. Is he a member of your committee as well? Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? All right, go ahead. Good morning, Chairperson Espinal, Chairperson Costa, members of the City Council, and of course, uh, Committee Council Samara Swanson. My name is Zanelle Hernandez, and I'm here to testify in support of evaluating the feasibility of microgrids across the five boroughs on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA empowers its member organizations to advocate for improved environmental conditions and against inequitable environmental burdens. Through our effort, member organi organizations coalesce around specific common issues that threaten their ability of low-income communities and communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including energy efficiency, renewable energy, resilient energy, energy storage technologies, microgrids, and community-owned energy projects that directly benefit these communities. Because a number of NIJA member organizations come from communities overburdened by greenhouse gas emissions and co-pollutants from power plants and dirty industries clustered in their neighborhoods, our organization is a key advocate of emissions reductions and renewable energy targets. Our New York City climate justice agenda is a multi-year research and advocacy campaign to address the need for a comprehensive community-based approach to community resiliency. In 2017, we released a report, a report which analyzed Mayor de Blasio's One NYC plan and made several recommendations to strengthen the city's policies in environmental justice communities. We highlighted that in addition to its promising economic potential, microgrids and solar plus storage technologies have can have extensive environmental and health benefits, particularly for vulnerable communities who have been historically exposed to noxious pollutants generated from traditional fossil fuel energy infrastructure. Resilient energy can provide power during emergency, blackout periods, peak demand, especially to vital facilities such as emergency shelters, hospitals, public housing, public schools, and in particular, the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. 
And while the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center has received funding via the Hunts Point Resiliency Process, the process has been slow and it utilizes fossil fuel infrastructure that co the community has major concerns about. This technology, wind, solar, storage, also has the potential to displace inefficient and dirty peaking power plants, thus significantly reducing air pollution in environmental justice communities. The city should study, prioritize, and streamline the deployment of microgrids and resilient energy system is, systems in the coming years. The city, the city should also study progress made to date and strategies to reduce barriers for microgrid development, including technical, policy, and regulatory barriers. We recommend that any microgrid cost-benefit analysis include economic, social, environmental, and resiliency benefits. In pursuit of a just transition, New York City should be leading the nation in the procurement of renewable energy and energy storage technologies that meet the ambitious emission reduction and resiliency targets that we've set for ourselves. NIJA commends the City Council for holding a hearing on the feasibility of microgrids and creating an opportunity for public comment on this important strategy to increase community resiliency. We urge the City Council to hold a hearing early next year on intro 1567. A just energy policy is central to NIJA's work and we look forward to, continue, to a continued co collaboration with the City to mitigate the threats of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, turn your mic on. Okay, can you hear me? We hear you. Good. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Dietrich. I am a member and volunteer with 350 Brooklyn, which is a local chapter of the international organization 350.org. 350 Brooklyn is dedicated to fighting the global threat of climate change on the local level. When we talk about fighting climate change, we are talking about ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as ways to build a more resilient New York City in the face of a warming world in which increasingly intense storms are likely. Microgrids help us accomplish both of these objectives. Like many residents of New York City, I lost power during Hurricane Sandy. At the time, I lived in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Red Hook, which was in the flood zone. Nothing of mine was lost due to flooding, but in Sandy's aftermath, my neighborhood went some three weeks three and a half weeks without power before it was restored. My regular daily life, I was a graduate student at the time, was entirely disrupted. I slept on friends' couches sometimes and at other times in my cold, dark apartment. I lived out of a bag and grabbed showers where I could. After my schoolwork, my daily priority became about finding where I could recharge devices so that I could stay connected to loved ones and the outside world. It was an extended period of disruption and displacement for myself and many others that can be completely avoided in the future. One clear way to achieve this is by investing in microgrids, as we've discussed. A microgrid is designed to be agile and autonomous, operating fully while allowing for a temporary disconnection to the broad, broader power infrastructure and being friendly to alternative sources of power. This flexibility not only enables the city to be resilient in the case of another natural disaster, but it also encourages the use of clean and currently available sources of energy like solar, geothermal, and wind. According to environmentalist and entrepreneur Paul Hawken in his book Drawdown, grid flexibility is one of the best ways we have to reverse global warming. Rather than being dependent on coal-fired and gas-fired plants hundreds of miles away, with microgrids, homes and communities can rely on solar panels on their roof and batteries in their basement while still being connected to the rest of the grid. Incorporating microgrids is key to ensuring that the desired flexibility is attained without risking consistency and sustainability. While New York engages in setting up microgrids, it is essential that we incentivize people and companies to seek out renewable energy. One of the best ways to ensure this is to allow homeowners and building owners to sell back their excess energy from rooftop solar panels to the grid. That way they can get paid for the energy they generate as the solar ice program was mentioned. In short, microgrids can help us both prepare for and prevent the threat of climate change. Renewable sources are by their very nature distributed and resilient. Thus, renewable energy must become a main staple of microgrids with solar, geothermal, and wind being major components. By New York investing intelligently in microgrids, it is one major step closer to being an advanced city making lives better for its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Up. 
Chairman Espinal, Chairman Constantinidis, members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs, and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony for this hearing on the feasibility of microgrids. My name is Scott Kessler, and I serve as the Director of Business Development for LO3 Energy and Brooklyn Microgrid, a community microgrid project uh, that I will discuss in a little bit. LO3 Energy is a young company with deep roots in energy finance and technology. We're passionate about the future of an increasingly flexible, responsive, and reliable utility grid. We are developing ways to give people and utilities opportunities to shape that future. The community energy microgrids that we are building enable utilities and neighborhoods to share in the responsibilities and benefits of reliable distributed energy resources. You may be familiar with the concept of the Internet of Things, the idea that our devices, machines, thermostats, automobiles, and appliances are able to use built-in sensors and computing power to communicate information, coordinate with each other, and manage our environment and our energy use intelligently and independently by following rules that their owners program into them. Our technology platform activates this Internet of Things within the local power grid enabling PV panels, batteries, and Nest thermostats to generate market signals that will govern and balance neighborhood loads, generation, and storage assets, and allowing them to coordinate with the broader interconnected transmission grid. Our platform enables this functionality by implementing a market in which neighbors, independent power producers, energy service companies, and utilities can choose to buy and sell energy and energy services on a peer-to-peer -peer basis in real time. For example, a neighborhood resident may run his washing machine when electricity in the local peer-to-peer -peer market is least expensive, perhaps when energy output from his neighbor's solar panels reaches its peak in the early afternoon. Or a department store may dial back its air conditioning when that local electricity is most expensive. For example, when a local utility transformer is being overtaxed in the late afternoon on a hot summer day. Currently, LO3 Energy is developing such a marketplace within the Park Slope, Gowanus, and Borum Hill communities of Brooklyn through a benefit corporation called Brooklyn Microgrid. The goal of this project is to enable the multi-participant marketplace for consumer choice that is envisioned by energy regulators in New York, and likewise to improve the local community's energy security during extreme weather events and other emergencies. Said more simply, neighbors can buy and sell energy, usually produced from a rooftop solar PV system, with one another. The Brooklyn microgrid can be thought of as a virtual microgrid, many distributed but digitally connected energy resources that are able to provide the same benefits to the Con Edison network as a physical microgrid, namely generation, storage, demand curtailment, and ancillary services, and is in the design phases to add physical resiliency. This community-based microgrid in Brooklyn, which can be replicated in hundreds more communities around the U.S. and globally, will create a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer energy network that also coordinates with the broader power grid. By sending appropriate price signals for energy and energy services, these locally optimized networks engage all market participants to deploy distributed energy resources and infrastructure upgrades in the most efficient manner. These local energy resources also provide resiliency for emergencies, reduce customer costs, optimize utility infrastructure investments, and enable renewable electricity, energy efficiency, and energy storage deployments within that community. Meanwhile, the new market drives community investment in jobs, boosting the local economy. This is a new opportunity for communities who, until now, have been dependent on the grid's central planners and unable to directly participate in, control, or contribute to the reliability or source of the electricity on the grid. Projects like Brooklyn Microgrid and distributed energy marketplaces enabled by the Internet of Things more broadly will enable consumers and communities to truly determine their energy future, their source of energy, when they want to use that energy, and the price they pay for that energy. Community microgrids represent novel approaches to the ideas of non-wires alternatives exemplified by the Brooklyn Queens Demand Management Project in Brooklyn. But rather than one organization doing procurements on behalf of local citizens, community microgrids also offer the opportunity for communities to express a preference for certain types of energy through their selection of where they get their electricity from. Local residents can be further empowered through the opportunity to own a portion of the community microgrid, either through investment in the organization directly or through a microinvestment in a community solar project or other energy asset. The role of public policy is key to enabling community energy marketplaces and community microgrids. Local policymakers can streamline the creation of these organizations through structures such as community choice aggregation, which facilitates the participation of entire community as one. Additionally, local policymakers can work with energy regulators, such as the New York Department of Public Service and Public Service Commission, 
to ease requirements for community energy marketplaces. Specifically, for one neighbor to transact energy supply with another, an energy retailer must take title to that energy in the interim. This requirement should be revised to enable direct transactions without unnecessary intermediaries. Um, I will just skip ahead and say, in summary, we think that community microgrids will be critical to enabling consumers to participate and benefit from community-based energy resources, both under normal operations and in emergencies. We see this as a win for the consumer, a win for the utility, and a win for the grid. We are grateful that these committees are discussing these important issues, and we look forward to serving as a resource as you continue these conversations. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver this testimony. Thank you all for giving testimony. Before you go, I have a few, I have a few questions. Yeah, so I mean, what is sort of the biggest impediment that you feel um, there is out there to seeing more uh, interest in microgrids on, on so sort of neighborhood by neighborhood level? Um, I would volunteer that it's probably existing energy regulation. You know, most of the rules on the book are structured so that you either have to be a utility, a power producer, or a retailer mm -hmm. in order to be able to transact in any way over the public grid. And now it really prevents some of these smaller um, participants from getting more engaged because their options are fairly limited in how they can get involved. Yeah. I think there are a lot of barriers, but two in particular are uh, what the definition of resiliency is. So right now um, in Hunts Point, we're part of this Hunts Point resiliency project to develop a um, backup energy and potentially a microgrid in the future. And in order to have resiliency, you need three days of backup power. And it's difficult for renewable energy and energy storage to provide that. So a big portion of that investment has gone to fossil fuel infrastructure, which is really concerning. So I want to make sure that the microgrids that we're investing in are renewable energy microgrids. Um, and then energy storage, of course, the technology continues to change very rapidly. And there's a lot of, you know, fire code or other regulatory barriers, physical barriers that don't allow for the placement of that in the critical facilities that need it the most. As far as energy sources, are there are those out there that uh, you look at as uh, opportunities for us to grow um, in the city? There are particular ones that you think uh, we could capitalize on and, and create more microgrids utilizing? I mean, definitely solar plus storage technologies. Solar plus storage. I would agree with that. I mean, I'm also, I would say I also say that in the right circumstances, combined heat and power is going to be a very important part of future microgrids. You know, right now it's sort of a little bit, microgrids are too reliant on that resource, but um, for certain situations, they may make sense as a more efficient means than the public grid as a whole. Right. With that, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Councilman Raspinall. So for Brooklyn microgrid, so you, you mentioned that the is you, uh, Brooklyn microgrid is a virtual microgrid, correct? Right now there is no ability to disconnect from the larger grid, which is why I call it a virtual microgrid. We are planning that physical disconnect, but uh, that takes a lot more years than actually getting the trading up and going. Right. So if, if, if the main um, power plant is down, do you, it would, would people who have solar panels on their rooftops and connected to the conventional grid able to uh, create or supply energy to their neighbors? In the so without that physical disconnect, no. Um, based on, you know, a lot of the rules Con Edison has to prevent sort of backflow onto the system. Uh, right now, actually, most owners with solar panels still become de-energized with the rest of the grid when we lose power. Mm -hmm. I think Costa probably asked this earlier, but it, again, I'm ask again, is there anything you feel that the city is not doing that they should be doing in order to to help the expand these programs and expand the, the possibilities of creating microgrids in the city? So I know the state, there's some issues in the state, right? Yes, most of the energy policy issues we run into are either set by the Department of Public Service or the New York Independent System Operator. Um, I would say that, you know, small projects like us, there's always ways to find support, but, um, you know, most of the issues we run into tend to be at the state level. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there's always a lot more that we can do. I think the funding needs to be there to do these large projects, but I, I will um, commend the city for um, committing to exploring storage technologies on all of their public buildings that are in a storm surge zone ver via their like public solar program. So I would say that that's definitely a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And for the Hunts Points project that you mentioned earlier, do you know what, what sort of fossil fuels they're looking to, or how are they using to, how, what, how are they things to generate fossil fuels to? 
Yeah, they're using the microgrid there. Uh, um, well, they're using some uh, solar and storage on two public schools. They're using a natural gas turbine, and then they're using like diesel backup generators. And this is for both the industrial and com and residential part of Hunts Point. And that's, you know, I mean, folks may know, but Hunts Point uh, Food Distribution Center is where the majority of the region's food comes from. So that's why it's such an important uh, resiliency project, not just for the South Bronx, but for the city as a whole. Okay, thanks. Thank you all for your testimony. We appreciate it. And uh, our next panel is uh, David Smith from Burns Engineering and Daniel Carpen, professional engineer. David Smith, are you here? All right, so I guess uh, Mr. Carpen will we'll put you on the clock and uh, have you go from there, and we'll have our last panel after you. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes, I do. My name is Daniel Carpen. My name is Daniel Carpen. I'm a professional engineer. I reside at 3 Hunt Harbor Hill Drive, Huntington, New York. I listened to the earlier testimony and it's very comprehensive. They have described some of the problems and uh, promises for microgrids. And basically I support everything that everyone had to say uh, earlier. And I have very little additional to comment at this point. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, last panel, um, I'd like to call forth uh, Cecil Corbin Mark from uh, We Act for Environmental Justice. Cecil, always good to see you, my friend. Same here. Same here. And I'll have Samara swear you in. Yeah, What's up, can you man? <laughs> I still love you. Yeah. Sorry. Can, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. All right, Cecil, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. Um, we Act for Environmental Justice <clears throat> is a Northern Manhattan-based community environmental justice organization. Uh, we are also a membership organization. And for the past three years, we've been working on developing a community climate resiliency plan known as the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. Um, that plan grew out of a series of planning community meetings around the question that was posed to community residents around the idea of developing what they needed for resilience. Uh, out of that process, one of the most striking things to come forth in the planning process was the community's desire to have more control over their uh, electric uh, grid. And as a result of that community planning process, we act in partnership with our members and residents of Northern Manhattan uh, more than 400 of whom participated in those planning meetings back in 2014, uh, developed an energy democracy focus for our Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. I think it's no surprise to anyone that communities have high expectations about electrical reliability, especially in the wake of Superstorm Sandy and its impact that it had on many vulnerable communities across the city. That reliability expectation is targeted most often at the utility providers. Virtually everything that people have to do depends on electricity, from preparing meals to banking to health care, et cetera. Electricity is not a luxury, it's a critical human right. And this places a high premium on reliability. Through our planning process, we've learned about our electrical system, but we've also discovered the we have to take matters into our own hands in our community. So what are we doing at this particular point towards the idea of creating greater re resilience in northern Manhattan, as well as taking more charge of the electrical system, no pun intended. We have started to build out a community process where we've aggregated affordable housing in northern Manhattan. 
and in a relationship with uh, Solar One and uh, several other affordable housing operators in northern Manhattan, we have targeted affordable housing that is either mission-driven and owned and operated by the organizations that are mission-driven, or affordable housing that is owned by residents in northern Manhattan. Why did we target that? We targeted those particular housing uh, types of housing because <clears throat> we understood from our community that uh, that sorry we understood from our community that a key concern was the growing creep of gentrification in northern Manhattan, and we also through our learning together understood that energy was probably the second biggest cost uh, that some of our residents had to bear after paying rent or a mortgage. Um, we also concerned that lowering the energy burden in northern Manhattan is something that would help not only save uh, resources for our community, but could potentially be one of the keys to uh, slowing the uh, significant creep of gentrification in northern Manhattan. And so we've aggregated affordable housing buildings, as I described before, into a pool, and we put out an RFP for a solar installer. I'm happy to report that with the community's participation, we selected a solar installer, Quixotic, and we are now working with them to uh, install solar panels on uh, affordable housing, as I mentioned before, in northern Manhattan. Before I go too much further, I also want to point out that we're not just focused on affordable housing, but we're also concerned with public housing in the city of New York, something that unfortunately we no longer seem to be investing in and building in, although I do need to commend the mayor for uh, putting some money towards uh, making sure that uh, there's greater sustainability uh, in uh, public housing. That said, uh, there are some public housing units in northern Manhattan that do not receive their power from NYPA, and we are targeting those. They receive their power from Con Ed, and we're looking to put solar and solar storage on uh, those particular facilities as well. And so uh, with that holistic approach to affordable and public housing in northern Manhattan, we are going forth with the idea of starting by putting solar and solar storage in as many particular facilities as we can, and we're looking forward to the city's commitment uh, of putting 100% renewable on co-located, what we deem to be co-located, uh, municipal facilities. So in other words, we're targeting where we choose to put uh, solar, uh, and we're then looking for what are the co-located particular public facilities that are owned by the city where there should be, uh, at some point in the future, 100% renewable. We're being that deliberate because the end result for us is to satisfy a claim that came forth from our community uh, that said they wanted to be able to control their electricity. They did not want to be the ones who watched as Wall Street lights were turned on well before the rest of the city's lights were turned on. They did not want that to happen again in northern Manhattan or anywhere else for that matter that was a low-income community or community of color. And so we're being deliberate in terms of aggregating not only affordable housing, not only placing them next to, or not placing them, but obviously co-locating next to uh, municipal facilities that are going to be 100% renewable, because for us, we see that as the start of building a community microgrid. Uh, ultimately, we intend to figure out how we jump over all of the state hurdles and city hurdles to get us connected in a place uh, in northern Manhattan where we can rely upon our own selves to turn back our power whenever a climactic crisis hits. Um, so I know that from our research together as a community that uh, microgrid seems to be something that doesn't have a clear definition or it has multiple definitions all across. Uh, the board, and so I want to offer that a community microgrid from our perspective in northern Manhattan is a coordinated grid area served by one or multiple distribution uh, systems and supported by really high penetrations of local renewable energy and other types of distributed energy resources such as demand management um, and storage, which is really critical. Uh, we think that this is a pathway to securing the climate resilience of our communities, and we are steadfastly working on that uh, path at this particular point. One of the other key things that I wanted to emphasize in our approach to building our own microgrid in northern Manhattan, as 
we talked about public housing. We talked about affordable housing of different types. Um, I also talked about municipally owned buildings. We are also targeting other institutions and entities in northern Manhattan. So whether they are universities, we are currently in discussions with Yeshiva University in Washington Heights, and they have committed to coming on board with our uh, installer and installing solar. Um, and we are about to tackle and target our big behemoth, Columbia University, and we will then move on to the City University of New York, which has multiple campuses in northern Manhattan. We are looking for any and all partners to help build resiliency in northern Manhattan by getting to the point where sometime in the future we will actually establish our own microgrid. We believe that that microgrid should have high penetration of local renewables, distributed energy resources. It should engage with energy efficiency and help the local users to make sure they're maximizing that. It should include uh, uh, a scalable solution to help us continue to grow as Northern Manhattan. And we believe that in doing so, we will create certain types of benefits, such as more renewable energy in a low-income community, a people of color community, a front-line vulnerable community. We believe that we will also help to uh, make sure that there's greater access and more control over that local power so that in the event of the next climactic disaster, that we will be able to restore some services, maybe not all, but some services to our communities. Uh, we believe that this is a pathway to reducing some of the public health burden that comes forward as we take more fossil fuel generated electricity out of the grid. We believe that we will be able to also improve the quality of the air and secure the residents of Northern Manhattan and in that way as well. Lastly, one of the things that we also believe that taking this path of building a, lo a local microgrid can help ensure is local work for local residents. We have made it a clear uh, mandate of the RFP that we have put forth for the solar installers that they must hire uh, from the training programs where we have trained local workers. And um, while we're still working out all of the kinks, we expect to get started in the spring uh, with hiring some local people for uh, the solar installation that we're actually engaged in. And we believe that if this scalable solution is presented, we can then do more of that to move forward. I've presented you all, or at least I've left copies of the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan for you. Um, it outlines several other key pillars of our Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan, but the energy democracy piece is the one that I have focused on most directly here. Um, with that, I will stop and take any questions that you might have. Uh, Cecil, first, thank you for your testimony. Uh, yeah, I've been to your training program. I've spoken to uh, some of the men and women that you're working with, and uh, glad to hear that, that as part of the RFP that we're going to be able to uh, see that, that work come to fruition for them, for their families, and being able to build a strong future. Um, so what do you think are the biggest obstacles are going to be from uh, your plan you sort of talked about the, the regulatory hurdles. Where, what, what type of hurdles do you expect to sort of run into or have run into so far that have made it more difficult for you to do this? Uh, on the regulatory side, I do believe, uh, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for the uh, folks, uh, men and women of the FDNY, given the fact that we just recently in my neighborhood had a huge, like, I don't even know how many alarm fire that you know, left a number of people, sadly, at this point in time uh, without a home to go to. Um, but I do know that there are lots of challenges with regards to even the installation of the solar panels and solar storage that uh, we have to figure out a way to both satisfy what uh, the women and men of the FDNY need to do their jobs effectively, but allow us to continue to move forth on the path to making sure that certain communities have a um, uh, uh, a clear path to renewables and a clear path to the kind of resiliency that that uh, solution offers. Uh, second, I think that there is also a, there's a, a challenge that comes forth with moving forwards to creating microgrids all over the place. If this isn't done in a controlled manner and if it isn't done with an eye towards how are we going to take care of those who are yet able to sort of migrate off of uh, the grid to some sort of microgrid solution, we could end up in a situation where, and, and this is happening now, where 
the wealthiest of New Yorkers are able to migrate off of the grid and have their own kind of resiliency. And then those of us who are in low-income communities and communities of color or moderate-income communities are left stuck with sort of putting the bill for a grid that is more than a century old on which our electrical system is built. That's a clearly unacceptable outcome for us as a community or a series of communities seeking to access renewable uh, power and storage and to develop some sort of control over our system uh, that provide electricity in our communities, especially when we have watched um, the, the uh, Con Eds and you know, other power providers in the city uh, prioritize turning on uh, the lights on Wall Street before they do you know, Amsterdam Avenue. So those are two regulatory hurdles. I do think that it's, Con Edison um, represents a bit of a conundrum in terms of working with communities. I don't think they've quite gotten that memo just yet. And, and whatever we can do to sort of regulatorily bring them to, to bear, I know this represents somewhat of a threat to the model of how they do business, um, but whatever we can do to make them understand that this is a system that has to transform. Um, we've got to do some of that. I don't know exactly what that is, but give me time. I'll try to figure it out. <laughs> gotcha. Now, I mean, so prior to you coming, uh, we had heard from the administration, and they had talked about how um, they were building a microgrid around um, the Red Hood houses, which mm -hmm. were severely uh, impacted by Sandy. Mm -hmm. And I commented on how we should, um, and I think there was mutual agreement with the administration on uh, seeking to look at all uh, residents of public housing, especially in areas that were impacted, and how do we, how do we create microgrids to ensure that um, those residents are not going to lose power or uh, have that that, those, that loss minimized uh -huh. um, during events like Sandy? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's uh, so. You know, kudos to the administration for taking those steps. Um, I'm impatient, and so I feel like everything should be done yesterday. Um, but I recognize that's not completely realistic. I think there is, if I can sort of, you know, um, pound the table for Northern Manhattan for a second, there are only two uh, public housing facilities in which the folks at NYCHA have uh, disclosed in partnership with the city that they want to put uh, solar on top of. Um, I think it's really important that we think of solar and solar storage, that we think about microgrids in a way that um, is sort of the truest complement in the way that I describe them, which has both the distributed energy resources, the generation capacity, but storage capacity, and that it is connecting and thinking not only about sort of islanding NYCHA campuses, but how do we connect those NYCHA campuses to what else is around it so that we become more of a cohesive community. Uh, my organization, uh, in partnership with the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, uh, did some research around uh, Sandy impacted public housing developments out in the Rockaways and Coney Island and so forth. And one of the findings coming out of that research was that communities that actually uh, fared better, fared better in many instances because uh, uh, communities in public housing uh, fared better because they were actually more socially cohered, that they were coming together, that residents actually worked together. And that, I think, is a concept that we need to take away, and we need to recognize that NYCHA campuses shouldn't be islanded onto themselves. Uh, obviously, the term islanding means something within this context, but I also mean in terms of how we knit this system together. How do we create a more resilient system? And so I would encourage them to, you know, figure out how to move faster and quicker with some of that stuff, but to also think about not just being myopic and thinking about, you know, oh, those are the NYCHA residents over there. Well, that kind of thinking got us into a lot of trouble. It reminds me of Robert Moses, like, put them by the river or behind the rail tracks, as my grandmother used to say. We got to stop thinking like that. If resilience is going to be something that we focus on in the city and talking about people resilience, then we also need to build communities, connect them in a way that makes them understand that they're connected about creating power for each other, um, both figuratively and literally, right? That can't be just like, oh, those NYCHA campuses over there. No, I, I hear you, and I agree with you. Um, I'm not impatient myself, so. <laughs> I I've noticed. We, yeah, so we, we sort of uh, have that in agreement. Um, so I think that how do we, are there particular 
uh, as you talked about solar and battery storage, we talked about co- you know, cogeneration. Um, are there other opportunities that you see for uh, microgrid power that's out there that maybe we're not tapping into? I mean, I think the, the cogeneration piece is an important one, and obviously we're not going to be, you know, 100% renewable tomorrow. Um, and really thinking about what that transition looks like. So um, I pointed out that in northern Manhattan, through our northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan, we are actually really targeting campuses and those facilities and really bringing them into a conversation as to what are you doing with all of the excess power that you have on your facilities. There are college campuses all across the city, and I could see that being a scalable model that moves forward into the future. Um, But that has to come with clear commitments to, you know, if there's any kind of municipal support or state support or, you know, someday in the future, 2020, um, when there is more federal support, um, you, you would then, I think, have to mandate that that support is tied to contractually in some way, making sure that there's a transition from Uh, fossil fuels to clean and renewable energy. And so I think those represent opportunities. There are also private hospitals in northern Manhattan. Um, uh, And we're, you know, we we have them on our list. They're a little bit further down. We've we've had some interaction with the campuses before, especially Columbia, uh, where we negotiated a community benefits agreement. And as part of, as one of the lead negotiators in that negotiation, I was trying at that point in time to negotiate lower fuel prices for um, uh, affordable housing by actually trying to, you know, edge in on Columbia's bulk purchasing uh, capability. Um, we got a little project going, but Columbia has stood in the way of that moving forward all the time. That's my interpretation and my organization's interpretation. Um, but those kinds of opportunities, I think, exist on you know, hospitals and private hospitals, college campuses, et cetera, because they are using often more uh, capacity than they, more of the electricity, they're not using as much of the electricity as they're generating, sorry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over at this time to uh, my colleague, uh, Donovan Richards. Such an honor to see you. Thank you, (laughs) thank you, chairs, for uh, holding this committee, and it's always good to see old friends. Right back at Uh, it. Um, So I wanted to ask you, uh, do you believe the city is maximizing, with an $85 billion budget, um, incentives to really uh, move the conversation, to move the city towards 100% um, uh, renewable? And and, uh, I'm interested in knowing, you know, if this money was available, what are the things you would, you know, if you had... Your if wish list, what are the sort day. of technologies you, you would really push um, the city? But I'm just interested in knowing, do you feel the city's maximizing opportunities? And then there's also this always this conflict between, um, and it's something we hear often, is even when we talk about multifamily units, right, mm-hmm. um, putting um, solar on a roof, like will those costs be passed down to residents? Mm-hmm. So I'm just interested in hearing your opinion on uh, how we would strike that balance and not pass down cost on to tenants, and is there a way for the city to play a role in this area via whether it's a zoning action or something of that nature? So I'll take the last part first and then uh, migrate backwards. Um, I think that uh, the issue of how do we protect tenants um, we were, when uh, in a previous administration, when there was talk of getting uh, a clean heat initiative together, I think we were very deeply embedded in sort of the development of that as part of the sustainability advisory team and then these smaller work groups that they had. Um, and one of the things that we constantly pushed for was to make sure that if we go forth with some of these very necessary Uh, modifications and improvements to the heating system, the benefits of which are very clear, you know, you cleaner heat, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, but also more critically to some of our members in northern Manhattan, you had the public health benefits of less particulate matter getting out into the chimneys and, you know, circulating into the walls and and, uh, of apartments. That was clear, but one of the challenges of doing that was exactly as you pointed out, uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Richards, the idea that 
landlords, private landlords, would then turn around and say, well, if you're forcing me to make these kinds of improvements, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I'm improving the value of my property, I still need to pass those on to uh, tenants, and I will seek any means to do that. And generally, the way that they would is through the uh, MCI program, Major Capital Improvement Program, operated by the state. I think that there, um, the the city, the, the city, the mayor's office has uh, recently put forth a package of proposals for improvements. And um, while I uh, have my, you know, concerns about that particular program. I'm not going to comment on that at this particular moment. I do want to say that the idea that they're thinking about with regards to uh, establishing or, or uh, accelerating a PACE program, uh, which has worked um, more successfully on commercial properties than it has on residential properties, but, and um, I will say that, you know, there's nothing like New York City, right? I mean, we all know that. We're, we're unique and very special. Um, but for them to come up with a program that mirrors that and to work with the council to actually get something like that up and running is important, um, but it really does need a lot of funding behind it if we're really going to deal with the challenges of making sure that those kinds of things don't happen uh, to residents in uh, privately held landlord buildings. Um, that said, the, the rest of the work is really at the state level to get the state to recognize that these particular uh, improvements are critical to other broader plans that the city and state have and that they need to recognize that we need to hold uh, particularly low and moderate income tenants safe um, in an effort to make sure that while we provide the kinds of uh, sustainability measures that move us forward as a city, as a state, as a country, um, we can't be doing that on the backs of, of, of allowing people to be kicked out of their homes that, you know, some instances they've lived for all their lives. And so that has to be addressed, that balance has to be addressed and worked out amidst all of the political stuff that goes on between the city and the state, but it's a key thing and we, there are hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that need to be protected. Um, so the city, summing up, the city needs to put money behind something like a PACE program and that's really critical and important. Yes, it needs to be developed and the council needs to work with the administration to make sure that uh, all of that gets ironed out and worked out. Um, but then there's a collective effort between the uh, mayor's office and the council to go to the state and make it clear that these are particularly challenging issues with regards to low-income folks and, and moderate-income folks, and we can't have people being kicked out uh, because we're making improvements that both protect their sustainability and their health. Um, the, the first part of your question around... Um, Tell me again, the opportunity that you were saying, I lost it, I should have written it, I'm sorry. Saying there's an $85 oh, with the budget. Dollar budget, and do you feel- Is the you, city you doing it? Would enough? prioritize one yeah. area. I think you said the PACE program, but are there any other things the city could be doing? Uh, um, I will say that, you know, in terms of moving forward on 100% renewables, um, getting these contracts sort of moved. Uh, the only other thing, well, there are lots of other things, but let me just confine it to this at this moment. One thing that I do think is really critical is making sure that as we move forth with 100% renewables, yes, that storage is factored in, um, and I'm not clear at this point that that's something that's a part of the thinking. So I do think that's critical and that money should be devoted to making sure that it's not just getting the renewable energy in, in terms of the generation part on top of the roofs, but to make sure that there's storage tied into this. As we see, if we're going to really build sustainable microgrids, we do need storage, um, especially if we're really trying to push towards 100% renewable. So that would be one thing which I haven't heard, and that just might be me being buried in other things but I would say that part. And then I would say the other part that's really critical is really figuring out and tying uh, this notion of uh, those of us who work in the environmental justice movement think about these things across a variety of spectrum. Uh, and it's tying this effort to get 100% renewable to the idea of creating jobs in our communities. And I know that there's 
a lot of work going on with regards to the you know administration's part of green workforce. I was at a meeting the other day with Dan Zerilli, and certainly that was a key thing that was being discussed. And I, I think that's good, but we've got to tie these things together. They can't be happening in sort of like, you know, disparate quarters, and then like, oh, look up, like you're putting solar panels on the roofs of, of the polo grounds, and the residents in the polo grounds, one, don't even know about it because nobody has come to talk to them about it, and two, we're not sort of prepping those folks for jobs in that sector, right? And so how do we make that happen, whether it's on schools in our communities, whether it's on police stations or fire stations, or wherever it's happening in our community, we need to tie those things together. And if I were mayor for a day, maybe that would be the challenge I would work on tackling. Wow, it's a political future for you. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, don't even try that. And I will just add on the battery storage. It was amazing. I just got back from Puerto Rico, and the speaker and, and a few of us visited yeah. uh, a, a Casa, I forgot the name of the place, but it was amazing. They had battery storage. Yeah. So while everything was out around them, they actually were Lights powered on. up, and that's where many of the residents came to get serviced yeah. because they were the only um, place with electricity in town. My last question is something simple. I just want the city to hear it. I just like to ask this question all the time. There are some real simple things the city can do on energy efficiency, right? <laughs> like require big buildings to turn their lights off at night. Do you have any ideas on, on this? Do you support um, these big monstrosities of buildings in, in the city, commercial buildings who burn their lights um, 24 hours with no one in them? Um, do you have any ideas uh, on, on, or do you think the city should review policy that, in um, one sense, preserve energy? Is that part of a strategy? It is. It is a certain. It is certainly a part of the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan strategy to pursue both energy efficiency. All of the buildings that we sign up, so we have uh, 16 buildings in a pipeline. Five of them have agreed to move forward. Uh, the other 11 of them have. Um, proposals that they are reviewing uh, in, in the hopes that, yes, they will move forward. Um, all of those buildings for us will then be uh, given some energy efficiency audits and, and really told sort of these, are, you know, putting solar on your roof is just but one step, right? We're talking about creating resiliency. We're talking about creating energy democracy and independence. You know, some of the folks who came to our planning sessions were like, I don't want to pay Con Ed no more. Well, you know that that might I don't be know a little how Con Ed feels about it. I, might, I don't know how Con Ed feels about it, but that might be a little bit far in the future, um, if at all. Yeah, but let's let's get some of this energy efficiency stuff going. As far as commercial buildings, like yes, I agree with you that they they should be. But I am more focused in terms of our plan on the types of affordable housing that you talked about that I talked about, whether it's affordable housing that's owned by the residents who've come through a till program or or are in HC, HDFCs in the, in the, in Northern Manhattan, or whether don't it's forget community land trust and right community there. land trust. Yes, absolutely. Um, and or whether it's mission-driven affordable housing, mm -hmm. I think we got to start there because people are losing their homes, and that to me, more than mm -hmm. sort of the commercial buildings, uh, I, I support you on that for sure, 100%. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm at 150 to 200% when it comes mm -hmm. with starting with energy efficiency mm -hmm. for people yeah. in my community and across the city. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a Harlemite, and you know, I need a visa to come down here or go. <laughs> Brooklyn or wherever else, but Queens, you know. You always have a passport to Queens. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, I, I support our energy efficiency 100%. It's a part of our Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. Mm -hmm. We've trained staff and we're getting ready. As soon as you know, we start working uh, with these buildings, uh, we're going to be making that a part of it. We just got a nice CERTA grant to do community energy planning, mm -hmm. and so that's going to be a key part of that as well. So energy efficiency, yeah, definitely. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. And uh, Cecil, I will certainly return mm. your call. I apologize for <laughs> so it no last worries. week and forgot. So it's always much good love. to see you at a hearing to remind me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so you're always welcome in Queens, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> I get my visa from you. <laughs> All right, with that, um, I want to thank the administration and everyone who testified today and really looking forward to uh, working. Uh, do, do, do you say something? Yeah, so, no, all right, so I want to thank, of course, my co-chair. Uh, I want to recognize Steve Levin, who's from Brooklyn, who's a member of the Environmental Protection Committee as well. Uh, thank our co-chair, Rafael Espinal, and everyone on the uh, Consumer Affairs Committee for their good work. Uh, our own uh, 
uh, attorney and great advocate, uh, Samantha Swanston, and Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, our financial analyst, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, uh, my own legislative director, Nicholas Wazowski, and Malkis as well. Thank you for uh, your great work in the Sergeant at Arms. With that, wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, this uh, committee hearing on environmental protection is adjourned. <laughs>